welcome back to the afternoon session of the Indian China uh, conversations. Um, I really don't want to uh, uh, repeat some of the things that's already been said this morning by Ashok and also Nimi uh, about the project. Um, but uh, just to add a little bit on the China, the, my involvement on the China part of this project, uh, I have to admit that I was one of the skeptics earlier on when this idea was first proposed and um, uh, for the reasons um, that Ashok already mentioned that I thought uh, that we required a lot, uh, advanced, I mean, master degrees and doctoral programs and also the comparative angle and also I'm always, you know, working in China uh, concerned with the language constraint. So I thought just by, because almost probably over 90% of the academic programs in China are conducted in Chinese. Uh, and therefore, I thought by that language, uh, English language uh, requirement alone, we would vastly reduce the candidate pool. Um, so, um, uh, but I, I think like Ashok and Nimi, the idea itself is so attractive that, um, that we, we wanted to be able to um, provide this uh, uh, forum in a field that's increasingly important, that's crying out for new critical voices um, um, that, um, that, that put these young scholars together with some of these established colleagues uh, and put them, uh, featuring them at the center of the forum is, is a rare uh, program. I mean, most of the other uh, programs are, are doing in a more conventional format. So I voted along um, to, to go ahead, we should give it a try, but um, uh, in the end, I think we're really happily surprised by the, the applications. Um, uh, just to let you know that when we, after we selected uh, the 10 finalists, uh, besides the, the three presentations you will hear here, um, in the Beijing Forum, we actually listened to a very interesting uh, paper uh, for example, comparing uh, the rule of uh, the Qing Emperor uh, Kangxi with the Mughal uh, uh, um, King uh, Akbar. Uh, and also we had a, a paper on the Chinese, I mean the Indian translation of Chinese literary classics. Uh, we also had a, 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 a comparative study on the Indian Chinese uh, marriage payment customs and its relations with the land rights. Um, we have a paper on the look east, uh, looking east policy, and we have also um, someone doing reflections on the, how U.S. managed Indian China uh, to, in Asia, to enhance its hegemony in Asia. So we have actually a, a very nice uh, wide range of topics uh, with uh, scholars covering, tackling the big issues and also we have you know, small case studies as for example Ken's paper you'll hear this afternoon. And so we're able to select from this nice variety of, of topics and also the applicants came really from not just Beijing but from you know, Nanjing, Tianjin, Yunnan, and uh, from Hong Kong, and with um, uh, doctoral students studying in England, in Australia, and in uh, JNU. Uh, so it was a variety of, you know, uh, of applications. And, so, and, and then also at the symposium, there were not only the, these established scholars give critical constructive comments, but some of the young scholars themselves really also were uh, providing comments on each other's works. And after the symposium, we heard from some, some of them that actually it was very seldom that they have an opportunity to meet uh, other young scholars um, uh, in this area, but not exactly in their field. Um, so this, this um, uh, uh, kind of uh, somewhat unconventional approach that we had, um, I think we got very, uh, positive feedback. So going forward from now, uh, we feel a lot more confident about it. And uh, here I also wanted to acknowledge um, uh, especially uh, Wei Zhong uh, from the Academy of Social Sciences who really worked with me very closely on this first round of selections and also uh, other institutes like um, uh, 
Dong Shi Kui's uh, Beijing Normal University and Wang Bangwei from Beida uh, also uh, helped in the selection process and also in the forum themselves. And I'm very happy to say that next year, uh, Yao Yang from Beijing University will uh, partner uh, with us for the second round of this uh, initiative. So uh, that said, I'm very happy to uh, introduce um, the four young scholars here. The first to go is uh, Li Lai Ru. Um, she is um, from the International Business School, Yunnan University of Finance and Economics. Um, and her topic is the role of law in social development analysis of legislations of China and India. And um, the two scholars who will comment, uh, summarize and comment on her paper, first to go is Peter Vanderveer uh, from uh, Max Planck Institute for the Study of Religious and Ethnic Diversity at Gottingen. <laughs> I wasn't able to pronounce huh? Gotham, <laughs> got you, okay. Uh, uh, from Germany, actually. <laughs> anyway, uh, and then second one is um, Sanjay Chaturvedi from the Department of uh, Political Science at Punjab University, who is also our uh, EC fellow. Peter? You can also just sit here, right? Um, yeah. Can... Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Keeping the aura. Um, well, So thank you for uh, inviting me to um, discuss this uh, wonderful paper um, by Dr. Lee uh, Lai Ru, uh, who is from Yunnan, and um, the, who confessed just to me that she is actually working on contract law, and uh, thereby uh, preempted my, uh, one of my comments, um, uh, namely uh, that uh, what she does here in the paper is, is really uh, broad and uh, she deals with all kinds of elements uh, of, uh, of the law uh, and the relation between law and social development. Uh, and for a uh, scholarly paper, it might also sometimes be good to just focus into something. And uh, uh, contract law, if that is your specialty, uh, would be an interesting field to look at how contract law is developing in, in uh, India and in China. Um, so as I said, she, uh, she does a broader thing, which is, on the other hand, very useful for me because I don't know anything about the law. And uh, <laughs> that's also probably why I've been invited. Maybe people thought, well, this guy's from Germany. There's a lot of law in Germany. <laughs> 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 Let him talk about the law. Um, uh, she starts by saying, uh, but because the idea is that we present uh, uh, the papers, uh, uh, the, the paper is about three functions of law. Uh, the first being protection of rights, uh, the second being signaling rights and obligations to citizens, and three, balancing rights of individuals, groups, and government. Signaling rights means, in this case, I think, uh, more or less communicating, uh, that the government communicates uh, rights and um, obligations to uh, the citizens. So that is an, is an as aspect that is maybe not fortunately, um, uh, the word signaling is maybe not entirely uh, the best word to use here. But that's what is, is being meant. The background is, is of the paper is rather philosophical, uh, saying, well, laws only work when they reflect the essence of uh, a society. So there's a connection between what Indian society and or Chinese society is about and, and laws. Now, it's very hard to actually know what India or China is about and what the essence of these societies are. And therefore, it's difficult to see what then the relation between laws and that essence is. Mostly these, these are constructed essences, and that's therefore rather difficult. There's another uh, philosophical uh, background to the paper is, is, uh, is an argument um, that the development of society must conform to the moral standards and values of that society. Now, moral standards um, mostly change uh, with development. 
uh, and uh, so um, the standards of the 19th century are not uh, the same as in the 20th century, so that they need, that the uh, uh, society needs to conform to moral standards uh, presupposes that there are kind of fixed moral standards uh, that will um, uh, be transcendent to uh, historical development. Again, I think the, the histori the, these kind of philosophical comments are not really very essential to the paper, so um, we don't have to really debate them very much, I think. The, the bulk of the paper is, is really about these three things, protection of rights, signaling rights, and balancing rights. So protection of rights, uh, there uh, she focuses on uh, rights of women and looks very uh, correctly, I think, at uh, family structure and employment. And the way um, uh, uh, women's employment is uh, uh, regulated and supported by legal arrangements in India and China. So that's a, that's a very important and interesting topic. The other uh, uh, aspect she looks at is uh, uh, rights of um, uh, consumers, the protection of consumers in uh, India and China, and what kind of legislation you have on these two, uh, on, on, uh, on consumer protection in India and China. The signaling, uh, so the communication of um, uh, rights and uh, duties of uh, citizens by the government, uh, in, she focuses on private property uh, arrangements in China. So how is private property... Mm. Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> only two minutes. Private property uh, since 1982 um, uh, is being protected in, uh, <laughs> uh, in China. And... Um, uh, that has also therefore created a, a large uh, private sector. Uh, nevertheless, he uh, argues that uh, patrimonial uh, arrangements are still very much important in, in China. And in India, uh, she focuses on uh, the importance of caste uh, for, uh, in, for, uh, in relation to the individual and, uh, and, and, and private property. The third element is balancing, uh, in, and she focuses here on, and I think very correctly, on government procurement regulation um, and uh, compensation uh, rules. Now, my discussion, for which I probably have less than one minute, um, is uh, that it is, I think, very good to what you do is to connect um, societal development, society, and law and not uh, just uh, as, a, as a philologist to look at, uh, at the law, the letter of the law. But it would be interesting to look at legal practice uh, and see how things actually function. For that, you have to uh, restrain probably your cases. Um, but it's, of course, very uh, obvious that we have a huge debate, both in India and in China, about corruption and about how a law is acquired, uh, land is acquired by the government and how government officials like Bosi Lai in, uh, in China uh, are uh, basically signaling or communicating to the public that there may be all kinds of laws, but that the judges and the police are in their hands. So the law functions within a particular kind of context uh, in which the state is very important and which political arrangements uh, are not independent from, from the law. Uh, Similarly, in India, of course, uh, that whole stuff around Anna Hazare uh, shows that uh, and uh, these uh, uh, 2G licenses, uh, uh, that is widespread uh, state corruption. And whatever laws you may have, that uh, actually uh, the, the, the matters on the ground are focusing us on seeing how legal practice is related to these matters on the ground. On the ground. To what extent there is an independent uh, um, legislature, an independent uh, uh, legal practice uh, in relation to uh, what happens in society. Now, in China, I think there is a deficit of law. Uh, in the 1920s, a lot of uh, law was just uh, copied from uh, Germany. And I know zero minutes, but I have still something to say. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> 
but I will do it, I will do it quickly. <laughs> Every previous speaker has been announcing, I do this in 30 seconds, and then they, they take five minutes, I do the same. Um, uh, so uh, in India, I think there's an excess of law. And uh, there's so much law around, uh, and there's so much uh, legal practice, as it were, that uh, people in my earlier field work uh, told me that they didn't inherit property, they inherited legislation, um, uh, litigation. So litigation, every, every, everything is being in court, as it were. What does that do? in society, what actually is that legal practice doing uh, in uh, protecting people? Uh, in China, you have a deficit of law. Uh, and uh, as I said, in the 1920s, uh, people were copying uh, German law in, uh, uh, in China. Um, it's really interesting to see how law is being made now. Uh, we have these constant delegations of people visiting Max Planck Institute for Law to, to get uh, uh, more law. Now, what is the relation between law and legal practice and the writing of law and legal practice? The other point I want to make is the relative independence from, uh, uh, from, the, poli uh, from the political in both India and China. Uh, in India, I think you have a very interesting kind of uh, development of activist courts that are courts that play, in fact, a political role. Uh, so for all kinds of uh, citizen action, uh, uh, courts start to play a role. That seems to be impossible in China. Uh, and uh, and I, I, I would be interested in hearing a little bit more about the connection between the courts and uh, legislation. Finally, I think, uh, I think you have something really interesting at hand here uh, by looking at procurement and, um, and especially uh, procurement of land. Uh, and um, it would be very interesting to see, both in India and China, how that actually works, uh, how land is being acquired and um, uh, how uh, contracts are being made by uh, the government and how that is protected. And I'm not entirely sure that it is uh, so much safer in India than in, uh, in, in China. Thanks. Uh, may I? Well, thank you very much. I'm very delighted uh, to have this wonderful opportunity to, uh, to comment on uh, an excellent paper with tremendous potential and also very grateful to Peter uh, for this uh, wonderful summary that makes my task easier. Now, what I would like to do is to uh, have a different take altogether on your paper, if I may, because you know it's very interesting how we read different meanings uh, into each other's work. Uh, reading your paper, uh, firstly, I was reminded of Amartya Sen in the sense that you know his argument that economic growth does not translate itself spontaneously into development. So your emphasis on social development uh, is, is very appropriate in my view. And maybe you would also like to sort of say a little more on human uh, development. I was also reminded of an excellent work with which you may like to engage uh, of Professor B.S. Chimney of Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi, uh, who has made a very interesting critique of what he calls the nascent global state in the making. You know. I'm also reminded of uh, Stuart Corbridge and John Agnew's concept of the hegemony of transnational liberalism. I think your paper takes us close to that, although it doesn't enter into that critical context. But your paper reminds us that there are striking commonalities these days between India and China. And those striking commonalities can be approached, can be analyzed in terms of Again, what I said, the hegemony of transnational liberalism. And what transnational capitalism is doing to the restructuring of the social, cultural uh, landscapes. Having said that, I was, I was wondering, uh, because you talk very nicely about what you call legal transplants. Now, the legal transplants of the colonial age were of a different kind. Legal transplants that are taking place now in the neoliberal age are of a different kind, which means that if you take that logic which you are doing, but if you push this logic a little further, you would see that probably you have to go beyond domestic law and look at international law. And I think this is where, again, your engagement with Chimney's work would be very interesting, because he shows as to how 
say, for example, through Land Acquisition Act of 2011, uh, you do talk about that text, but you forget to mention the year. You know, how through this act, you have uh, international law, you have WTO norms, for example, uh, uh, pushing the, uh, the transformations in legal, domestic legal systems. So when my, uh, I hope it's constructive enough, a uh, critical comment on your, your paper is that, why don't you also take a look at the role of international uh, law? Uh, I completely agree with Peter that you know there is you 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 uh, you are in a way trying to offer what we can say alternative perspectives on law from global south, and I think this is where I see tremendous potential. Of course, you go to social contract, you 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 uh, talk about uh, you know uh, whole whole range of issues. You you take a gender your engagement with gender perspective. I thought is very interesting. Although on that particular point, I would urge you to be a little more nuanced. Uh, you haven't talked about the women reservation uh, legislation, for example, that has come into play uh, in India, you know, which gives 30% uh, uh, reservation to women in Indian parliament and legislative bodies. Uh, but I think the real strength of your paper is your engagement with what Peter said, the issue of land. And what's happening, for example, in India, with regard to the, uh, the, the for example, if you engage with a wonderful article which Jayanta has written recently in EPW uh, on, uh, on, on, on the way in which you have uh, uh, displacements or dispossessions through accumulation, you know, to borrow from David Harvey's work uh, on new imperialism. You also have a range of articles which have been published in EPW, for example, on how Mumbai is now being turned into, into Shanghai. At least that is, that is the kind of statement which Indian Prime Minister made, uh, Mr. Manmohan Singh, when he went to Mumbai just after becoming Prime Minister and said he wanted to change Mumbai uh, into Shanghai. The way in which you have, for example, uh, attempts being made to turn Calcutta into London so you have some very interesting developments taking place uh, in India today. You know, all around the question of land, land acquisition. If your critical, your critical engagement with urban settlement plans, with rehabilitation plans, I thought, uh, you know, could be much more uh, uh, useful. Now, I do have, uh, in the last two, uh, two minutes that I'm left with, I do have uh, a number of problems, quote unquote, to point out. Uh, one is that um, I think it's probably, I'm sure it's a typographical error, but a huge one. You talk about one billion untouchables in 1970, right? Uh, India touched <laughs> one billion population mark in August 2000. Uh, Metaphor. So, so I think uh, that is one. The second is that, you know, uh, I think you, you, uh, you, you say that um, untouchables and Dalits <coughs> are only workers and cleaners. I think uh, you have to engage with uh, Geoffrey Lowe's uh, work called The Silent Revolution. Mm -hmm. You know, in the way in which Dalit mobilization and Dalit empowerment has happened uh, mm -hmm. in India, I think that is something which uh, you will have to uh, take into uh, account. And lastly, as I said, um, it would be very, very useful uh, to emphasize that despite striking differences between India and China, in terms of political cultures, in terms of, uh, there are striking commonalities uh, between these two countries in the context of uh, the hegemony of transnational uh, liberalism you know, in the neoliberal era. So I think I'll stop on that. Thank you, we're well uh, within our uh, time frame. We actually saved 30 seconds for the Q&A. <laughs> <laughs> and I apologize for the embarrassment factor. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think also the laughter uh, uh, make us uh, all more awake. Um, anyway, let's go to the questions. We can either bundle them to, oh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm skipping ahead. Okay, uh, maybe Lilai Ru, first you respond to the two uh, panelists. Very short one. Uh, thank you very much. Um, um, it's very. It's my first time to uh, share my research um, with people from um, all kinds of uh, subjects, and uh, it's always uh, your 
suggestion is always uh, valuable uh, to me. So, and uh, <laughs> it's like a, um, I think I have a, a very, very uh, big title to talk about it because um, it's a very uh, dangerous, uh, I think it's dangerous to do that because I have, I, will, I, I think I, I'm supposed to have a lot of questions to come. <laughs> Um, but uh, I really uh, want to do that because it, this, uh, the title of the, uh, this, art, this paper is, um, is what I'm really interested in. Um, so um, I think for the first step, I focus on the legislation because this is an um, easier thing to compare between India and China. Uh, I can have... Um, a lot of things, a lot of uh, articles and uh, legis acts to read to uh, depend on my research on. And uh, just as um, professors suggest, for the next step, uh, my plan is to do something more interesting, like the uh, judicial system. Maybe I will talk about the corruption problems in China and in India. I think they, both of the countries have uh, the same problems to uh, resolve. Um, and um, also about the international, international laws, I think that is also a uh, second step. Because, and it is even more important um, for, for India and China to each other, because if they, you want to do investment and international trade to the other country, you have to know the um, uh, wage uh, conventions they have been, and uh, do they have a bilateral uh, laws between themselves? It is, it is um, uh, significant um, for both of them. So this is I'm supposed to be, to, uh, I'm supposed to do, in uh, for for the next step. And uh, I think my my research is uh, uh, totally. Most of my research is uh, most of my research focuses on the uh, legal knowledge, but um, when I'm doing the research, I find it's um, very important to know knowledge from the the politics, politicals and the cultural and uh, even language. So I'm uh, uh, I am um, <laughs> I'm looking forward uh, to have comments from all of you. And I think you um, you can give me very valuable uh, uh, ideas about my research in the future, and uh, maybe and and even I can uh, correct some understandings of mine uh, after your comments. Thank you very much. Right. Okay. Questions? I um, see. You. Okay, Mao. Uh, should she come up to the front? Or? Okay. Yeah, okay. we can hear you. Yeah. Is this a recording? Oh, for recording. Okay. Who's going to listen to all that? The FBI will want to be a suffering type. <laughs> I speak loud enough so yeah, 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 yeah. your, your minds, right? Okay. Uh, just a uh, you know, just a little uh, surprise there. You said uh, the uh, what defines law in China is patrilineal. You know. uh, what defines law in China is uh, patrilineal uh, conventions, right? But what defines China uh, law in India, especially with that position tonight, then is a caste system. Now I'm wondering how far you can push the category of caste when you talk about land procurement in India. Because my sense is that with recent um, you know, scandals on land acquisition, etc., caste has had a very small role to play. It's really been communities that have been dispossessed of them, not on the basis of caste, but on the basis of quote unquote development, single for example. Right? So I, I'm just sort of wondering how far you can push the category of caste. And secondly, I'm sort of also wondering, um, you know, um, and, and this is a sort of commonplace, I think, that a lot of us who sort of read on China know or think, uh, and could be incorrect, that the basis of Chinese law until quite recently, despite the 1920s uh, borrowing from Germany, has been a communitarian conception of law, right? 
it's not really a question of upholding individual rights, but the rights of the community. And uh, I'm wondering whether there's been a change in that perception in Chinese law. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, I mean, this is a, like you said, this is a big topic. Uh, you can do a lot of things uh, in this framework between China and India, uh, in the framework of urban law and social development. Um, but it seems you know, in the paper, to do all the things together, that's uh, a little bit too ambitious. It's much better for you to narrow down just to talk about one thing for land acquisition. This is a big problem in both countries. And how does law play a role uh, to enhance people's rights? And how those laws are being changed in both countries uh, to accommodate their people's rights? Uh, in China, you see this change. But for, uh, if, uh, now you, you are hearing all the stories uh, about those farmers uh, becoming millionaires. <coughs> Overnight, just because uh, the government uh, increased the compensation. There is a clear law now in China saying that uh, you have to compensate uh, those farmers or residents uh, by commercial prices. Uh, so th that's a development. Uh, but uh, how did that happen? And uh, similarly in India, uh, I'm sure I'm not an expert on that. There must be some changes. Um, well, uh, uh, Peter said that we, we cannot generalize, but in this case, uh, you know, the, the, the contrast between those two countries, I think, that is very important. Uh, in India, there is a democratic system, and, you know, and the process of making those laws might be different from China, but still, you, you see uh, results in both countries. Why? You wouldn't, you know, in the standard theory, you wouldn't say that China should have those laws protect those farmers or landowners in general uh, because it's an authoritarian uh, state. Uh, but in end, you, you see that law. Okay? You see the change. Now, why did that happen? Uh, this kind of comparison, I think, uh, is important and is going to increase our knowledge about democracy and other alternatives. Okay, um, present it, and then we have her. Yeah. Uh, just an extraneous question. Uh, the, in, in China, uh, land use rights are still held by, are held uh, cooperatively, right? The, the Tanwe or the, what's it called, the production team, the Tue. Huh? And so the village community. Yeah, okay. So if that. Use rights. Cooperative rights, land. So, how, in the process of land grabs, is it the structure of the village collective? That is important, or is it individuals? Can I yeah. just add to that uh, a, a small comment on, uh, say, the historical nature of uh, this question? That basically, it's very hard to speak about the land acquisition now and the legislation now without taking into account the um, uh, land reforms in India and in China. So the whole uh, question about what what is actually <coughs> private property is related to a longer history from the 1950s uh, in which, say, the question of caste does play an important role. Uh, so uh, rural inequality in relation to caste is, a, I think, a very important issue. But, but you need a little bit. So when you focus on one question, you can maybe then have some more time to also do it a little bit more longitudinal, as it were. Uh, go a little bit into the history of this, uh, this whole question. Okay. Um, let her respond first, I think, to these questions, and then we'll have the next <laughs> About the land acquisition. Um, actually, I think this is a hot topic. Um, and it's it like this, and uh, for, the, for the ownership, we have the national, we, we don't have the, it's, it's not individual uh, ownership. 
we have national owned land and the um, village collective owned land. But um, it is criticized. There is, a, I remember in uh, 2008 or 2009, there were uh, farmers from uh, three counties in China. They uh, pronounced the ownership of the land by themselves because it's, it is um, back to the 19, uh, back to the 19 uh, 50s. It is a political contract between the CCP and the farmers to give them land and it will help me to get the, the to build the build up the government. Um, but um, they didn't uh, for the for the farmers' view. They didn't commit their uh, uh, promise. So this is uh, I think this is a big problem in China. And um, for the uh, Actually, in my in my article about, uh, I I just uh, very uh, interested in I'm interested in um, in um, in a problem about to find out the boundary between the public power and the private right. I think there there should be a balance between them. But you know the Chinese government is very powerful, and uh, I think the land acquisition and is. Um, is a very good example to explain this uh, issue. Actually, why? Uh, uh, actually, there is some um, two processes. The first one is about uh, land acquisition, the acquisition of the land. Um, in a legal view, I think I think it it, it is administrative conduct. So um, you have to <laughs> you ha you have to. Um, it is an administrative conduct, so the, 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 the right of the um, private uh, is not, is in a sec, um, how do you say that? The public, the, uh, the interest of the whole people is the, uh, in the first place. So it's, a, in, it's, it's another thing. But um, for the second one, the compensation agreement between the government and the privates, I think it's, um, it's not um, administrative conduct. Uh, it is actually con contract. So there are on, there are on the e they are equal. So the private should have the power, should have the uh, should have the right to argue with the government if they are not agree with uh, compensation. This is a problem. But um, in in India, India, in India, they uh, uh, India is in a uh, common law system. They have a, a, a concept called a government a government <coughs> contract. It is a civil contract. But in China, we are in a continental uh, legal system. We don't have such kind of thing. We have administrative contract. It's different from government contract. But the good thing is, in the last year, China have um, passed a new act about the land acquisition, especially about the compensation agreement. They will introduce a neutral party to uh, give appraisal of the, la the, the value of the land. Uh, but uh, India, I don't think so. So I think it's, uh, they make progress um, for, for such a kind of thing. And uh, this is... Um, um, this is a trend to after, especially uh, 2007, the uh, property, property Act, Property Law of China. Yeah, 2007, it is a trend to focus more on the individual rights. And my research, uh, this paper is, um, is not in a traditional way because in the past it is uh, actually the limi limitation of the popular power is um, is what the administrative law, uh, legal research do. But uh, I try to uh, do the research from the view of the protection of the private rights from the civil and commercial law. So different view angle. Hmm. Right. <laughs> <laughs> OK, that's on time. OK, uh, so let's have the next few questions. Um, I'm popular. <laughs> <laughs> you have a lot. <laughs> okay. One. Okay. You go. Next. Can you go there? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, what does that mean? We have no time for more questions. Oh. Um, 
Maybe I, I, yeah, I can leave just that. Uh, just a couple of points on what you said and what Peter said. Um, in India, there is nothing like a uniform system of land acquisition and distribution because it falls within the uh, jurisdiction of states. It slightly, if not uh, vastly, varies from state to state. For example, a state called Kerala, years ago, when it was under communist government, mm. those absentee landlords, by which I mean those people who did not directly cultivate the land, they ceased to be landlords. Those who cultivated became overnight, became owners, thanks to the legislation passed by the communist government. So also, slightly different legislation uh, occurred in various states. I don't know how it is in, I think it is centralized the system in China. And this caste system, this people who became landowners overnight, nothing to do with the caste. Those who cultivated the land, maybe higher caste are in a majority. Uh, the Dalits, to use that word, um, they did not. They were, they were just laborers. Many of them did not directly cultivate, but others. In other words, it has nothing to do with the caste system. Well, I doubt that. By default. Anyway. Everything anyway. has to do with the taxes. So, oh, everything? Uh, <laughs> land. Yeah, everything has to, yeah, 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 as I said, as I said, high caste people cultivated the land. Yeah, so. The Alice did not, they were not lucky enough to possess it. Yeah. Even that relationship, the cultivation, they did not do. They worked as laborers. Mm. To that extent, yes. But the law did not specify. They, the law did not dictate that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, I, I, we actually don't have time. Um, or so maybe we can communicate afterwards, or if we run early, then we can have some more responses or discussions. I'm sorry, but thank you, all three of you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.